So if you were here last Sunday, Justin built on some discussion that we had laid about our enemy. Not something that we like to talk about, definitely not something that I like to talk about. But it's real. It's a very real force that seeks to kill and destroy. Justin used the examples of Judas and Peter when Jesus was crucified. Both gave in to temptation. One experienced the redemption of Christ, and the other succumbed to the condemnation of Satan. Justin ended with a statement that he prays we are strong enough to resist not only the temptation, but the condemnation of our enemy. If you missed that one, you should go check it out. We put almost everything on YouTube, unless whoever said it feels like they really botched it up. And then things that uh, we feel are more mass appeal, we put on Facebook. So if you've missed any sermons and you want to check them out, go to YouTube. What I want to talk about today isn't necessarily built on that, but I've noticed over the past couple months that we keep getting on these kicks. It's like a month or two months long where everybody who's talking is sort of talking about and around the same things, and it becomes a conversation that this church is having with itself. We're talking things through, we're working things out together, and I think by doing that, we help each other understand. So I'd encourage you to stay a part of the conversation so you know kind of where we are and can help bring clarity through your own experience and understanding. I'll also mention that I borrowed very heavily from Charles Spurgeon's sermon on the topic that I want to speak on today. If you want the real deal, Google Spurgeon sermon number 3,562. The man died at 56 or 57 and preached almost 3,600 sermons and a lot of bangers too. Like if I could preach one like he did, that, that would do for me. Anyway, I thought a lot about Justin's message and about Peter. Peter has a confidence that I really admire. He's, he's that guy, just up and ready to do it. But when you watch Peter, I can't help but giggle sometimes. You remember from Justin's message, Peter swore up and down he'd never deny Jesus. Jesus, I'll go, to, I'll go to the death with you. Never deny you. But somehow before the next morning had managed to do it three times. Couldn't even make it a day. It wasn't the first time that Peter's enthusiasm fell a little flat when it was tested. So we're going to Matthew 14 today. This is right after Jesus fed the 5,000. Everybody was full at that point. They had cleaned up the leftovers, and we pick up in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus told his disciples, you guys go on out on the boat. He told the crowd, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You know, show's over, time to go. And he went up the mountain to get some alone time. While he was up there, the wind picked up and had this boat rocking on the waves pretty far out. Said the wind was against it. They were fighting the headwind. Verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? If you spent any time in church at all, this is the story that you've heard. Our little ones will get this story in kids' church back there at some point. Maybe not today, but they'll get it. It makes for a good kids' church story because it shows real truth about our human experience in a real-life example. And it's simple. Peter had faith, walked on water, saw the waves, faith wavered. Started to sink, yelled, save me. Jesus saved him. It's very simple, right? The kids' curriculum will no doubt wrap it up with a neat and tidy, keep your eyes on Jesus and you'll be fine. They'll color a picture, lesson learned. And it really is the lesson. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. 
So we're going to spend a little more time on it this morning. First lesson I think we can learn is that our lives as Christians are a mixed bag. One minute we have faith, we're walking on the water. The next minute we see the waves and we're sinking. If you've just started out your faith journey, or if you've just got serious about it, it can be really easy to be this guy. All right, God, let's do it. I'm ready. All right. I'm never going to fall to temptation again. I'm never going to sin. Everything's going to be great. Let's go, go, go. And then you turn around and life and temptation and fear and struggle and doubt all hit you right in the face. Like Iron Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. If you're new to the faith or just thought you were the only one who didn't instantly become invincible when they gave their lives to Christ, I've got good news for you. You're not alone. This is all of us. Our faith gives way to fear, and we have to ask for help and try again. Second thing that I think is interesting about this passage is it shows us the kind of things that faith is good for. What, does, what did Peter's faith if only for a couple seconds, allow him to do? What does faith allow him to do? What was he doing specifically? He was walking on water. Why not land? Why didn't his faith allow him to walk on the land? Why wasn't that the story? Because Peter could walk on the land. It doesn't take faith to walk on the land. He can do it. Faith isn't needed for things that we can do ourselves. We can just do them. I think I've shared this before, but my grandpa was one of my heroes of the faith. And not just the faith, but heroes in general. Before he passed, I was at his house and I was talking with him about a really big decision that I was trying to make. Other than giving my life to Christ and getting married, it was the biggest decision that I had ever made to that time. He helped me with the marriage decision too. It went something like, just marry her already. She's the one. <laughs> that, was, that was good advice. Anyway, I'm giving him the rundown on my decision, my dilemma, the pros and the cons. And I'm telling him everything that I've got figured out, all the things that I was sure of. And then I was telling him about all the things that I needed to get sorted before I could make the decision. He let me spin my wheels and bring him to my state of confusion. And he said, Adam, if you had it all worked out, would you have to have any faith? And that statement just set me back on my heels. It showed me something about my grandpa's faith that seemed kind of crazy. He looked for opportunities to have faith. Meanwhile, I was doing everything I could to not have to have faith. For grandpa, it was an opportunity. Here's a, here's a thing that aligns with God's will. There's nothing wrong with it. You're in a good place. It, it seems like the type of thing that God would want you to do. You've got this much figured out. You need him for this much and the things you don't see. Great opportunity to have faith. Meanwhile, I was looking at the same situation saying, I need to just check all these boxes so that I don't have to have any faith. When he said it, I thought it was crazy. Why wouldn't you work it all out first? It felt reckless. It felt irresponsible. But my grandpa knew the God that he served, and he wasn't content to only accomplish what Olin could accomplish. He wanted to accomplish what Olin could accomplish with faith in God. I believe that he looked for opportunities to have faith and to put that faith into action. And I also believe that he talked with God enough to know the type of things that he should have faith for. They had enough of a relationship, enough of a communication that he wasn't having faith for things for himself or things that would bring him glory. But rather he was having faith for things that he thought were part of God's plan, what God wanted for him. This is still a big struggle for me. At work, here at the church, in my involvement with the school, I wanna figure out everything first. I wanna be responsible. That's what you're supposed to do when you're an adult, right? But there's a lesson in Peter that shows us how much more faith can accomplish than what we can do on our own. Will I be content with what I can learn and do on my own, or will I look for opportunities to have faith, to do things that I could only do with God, the impossible, the impossible for Adam, the possible for God? Now, who remembers what Jesus was doing 
when Peter was walking on the water? Anybody? He was walking on the water. The third thing I think we can take from this story of Peter is that having faith will make any of us more like Christ. Jesus was walking on the water with his supernatural power. Peter was walking on the water with the power that was given to him by Jesus through his faith. But to anyone watching, if you didn't know Jesus and you didn't know Peter, they looked alike, right? They looked the same. If there were two guys sitting on a porch, you know, having a cup of coffee, just looking out over the lake, and they see two fellows walking on the water, whew, it's going to say something, isn't it? Number one, this is miraculous. And number two, there's something different about those guys. Not every day you see guys walking on the water. We just discussed that faith isn't needed for the things that we can do on our own. It's not needed to walk on land. It's not needed to play a guitar. It's not needed to stand behind a microphone and talk. It's not even required to be a good person, to be kind and generous. That doesn't take faith. We can do those things if we set our mind to it. We can decide and do all those things on our own. But our faith enables us to do things that only God could do when we allow his power to work through us. Faith in Jesus makes us more like him, and it enables us to do things that make people scratch their heads when they see it. When Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come on the water, he was saying, Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to do the thing that you're doing. Our faith starts when we trust God to save us. Something we can't do on our own. I can't provide my own salvation. I'm trusting God for that. That is the beginning of a Christian's faith. I need a savior. I'm trusting you for it. And then it grows as we use it to help us to resist temptation, to resist the things that seem like a no-brainer. This is absolutely the thing I should do, but we know better. And our faith helps us follow the truth. It grows more as we learn to humble ourselves and exalt God, relying on Him for more and more, and ourselves less and less. And it becomes powerful when we step out of the boat onto the water and do something that we are sure we can't do, but we are sure he can. If you want a measuring stick for your faith, just look to see how much you look like Christ. Are you walking step by step with Jesus? If two people saw you and Jesus walking, would they be able to tell the difference or would you look the same? Or are you walking step by step with the world? Do you look any different than everybody else? Just like Peter, this can change back and forth for us many times, sometimes very quickly. But it's a fail-safe way to gauge our faith. How much do we look like Christ? When Peter got out of that boat, I believe he saw the waves. I think he swung a leg over and put his foot on that water and expected it to hold him because he had faith. And it did. But the scripture we read said when he saw the wind... He was afraid and began to sink. He trusted God. He had faith for the waves, but he hadn't considered the wind. Hadn't thought about that. The fourth point I want to make is that doubt, fear, temptation, whatever it is that causes our faith to waver, is probably going to come at us from an angle we hadn't expected. I told you how I calculate everything out and have a plan for everything. Peter wasn't so different. He had faith, but it was calculated. Okay, I know how to walk. I know all these things. I'm going to need to have faith to walk on the water because it doesn't normally hold people up. I'll have faith for that. And he stepped out. But then he hadn't thought about the wind. Hadn't considered that in the calculation. Had enough faith for the water, but not for the wind. And when he saw it, it was too much. He began to sink. When we bid a job at work, we put money in for all the parts and materials and all the things we know how to do, all the labor, all that stuff. A lot of our stuff is kind of one-off and custom, so 
A lot of times there's a component to our jobs of things that we don't know how to do, but they're going to pay us to figure out. So we put money in the job for things that we don't know how to do. And that's going to be a little more money because it's going to take time to figure that out. But the stuff that kills you on a job aren't the things you know, and they're not the things you know you don't know. The stuff that kills you on a job are the things you don't know you don't know. It's not so different with our faith. We think in human terms and we say, I've got this part. I can do this. I'll have faith in God for this part. And that's the job. And then we go. But we don't even realize that we've got this part. We'll have faith for this part. And we're going to need faith for the thing that we don't see coming. As we work to grow and strengthen our faith, we'll do well to consider that there are many things we don't know that we don't know. And we need to have faith for those things as well. It's crazy that we do it. Even though we'll have faith for a part, we somehow think that the next part is going to be too impossible. I'll have faith for this impossible thing, but that other impossible thing, ah, it's just a little too much. Why would we think that God is big enough for the one, but not the other? The reality is when we get tripped up, it's our faith that was only big enough for the one. Finally, let's look at Peter's response as he started to sink. Before that, let's look at Adam's response when he starts to sink. I'll tell you what I do. I recalculate. I run the numbers again. Oh, man, I, I, I know I had that in there somewhere. Surely I thought of that. Uh, what's, the, what's the plan C, B, D, E now? What are we going to do? And if it's still not working and I'm still sinking, I start to get a little bitter. Maybe I look for somebody else to blame, pass the buck to. Well, I, you know, I did my part, but <laughs> Jeremy back there, way to go. I get in a funk. I feel bad about myself. I go down with the ship, sink, just feel miserable. Like I do too often before big decisions, I try to work out my own plan and get my own resolution, and I just keep sinking. What did Peter do? Lord, save me. He wasn't even under yet, but he recognized that his footing wasn't as strong as it had been. My ankles are now underwater. This is not going the right direction. Lord, save me. I need help. The minute his faith wavered, he knew he had a problem. But he didn't lose his faith. He used what I'll call his backup faith. God, I don't have the faith I had a second ago. Save me. Not the faith to walk on water anymore, but the faith to count on Jesus for salvation. His original faith. The very first faith that we have. God, I trust you to save me. As that faith grows, we can use it to resist temptation. We can use it to be more like Christ. We can use it to throw a leg out and walk on water. But we're people. And our faith's going to waver at times. Don't lose your faith. Go back to your original faith. Lord, save me. That's how we got into this mess. That's how we got started together. I'm back to that. Lord, save me. His backup faith. His original faith. Obviously, that faith wasn't preferable to the strong faith that had him walking on the water, but it was all that he had left. So he went with it. In that moment, I'd say that he learned a whole lot about himself and a whole lot about Jesus. In case you're wondering, Peter's response is the correct one, not Adam's. He didn't wait to hit bottom. He didn't pass blame. He didn't go down as a martyr to his own lack of faith. He recognized the problem and he cried out for help. Jesus did correct him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? But he also saved him and set him back up on the boat so that he could try his faith again and again and again. Spurgeon said in his sermon, to walk the water is not an essential characteristic of faith, but to pray when you begin to sink is. To do great wonders for Christ is not indispensable to your soul's being saved. But to have the faculty of always turning the heart to him in times of distress is one of the sure marks of divine grace in the soul. I said at the beginning I can kind of laugh sometimes at how sure Peter is one minute and then how fast he wavers. It can look silly, but you know what? 
I've never walked on water. I've never had such a strong faith that said with full chest, Jesus, call me out of the boat to walk on the water like you are. Take me out of all of my comfort and put me out in danger with you on the front lines. I've never had that strong faith. Maybe one day I will. Laugh at Peter all you want. The man walked on water. If only for a second. He had faith. Peter's faith had its ups and downs. But the man is recognized as the first leader of the Christian church. His faith carried him through. It carried him to his eventual death for the sake of Christ. He might not have had enough faith to see it through on the water or to stay strong the night that Jesus was crucified. But the hallmark of Peter's faith was that he never completely lost it. He cried out, save me, when he felt it slip and he tried again. I don't know what God has in store for you if you'll put your faith in him. It might not be big, but it might be. There's only one way to find out. Let's pray.